Thank you for joining our final webinar and our five-part Open NFP Spring Webinar Series. Today, Simon Peter is going to present Accelerating Networked Applications with Flexible Packet Process. In this webinar, Simon will present a number of reusable offloading mechanisms that can help data center software processing efficiency. He will show how to implement these mechanisms in the P4 programming language and discuss their efficiency using experiments run on the Netronome Agilio SmartNIC. A copy of the presentation, archived replay, as well as any project code will be made available shortly after the webinar. These, as well as our previous webinars, can all be found on the classroom page on the OpenNFP.org website. Simon is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where he conducts research in operating systems and networks. He received a PhD in computer science from ETH Zurich in 2012. Before joining UT Austin in 2016, he was a research associate at the University of Washington. Simon investigates what hardware and software should do past the end of Denard scaling. Let me describe OpenNFP before I turn it over to Simon. OpenNFP's objective is to support and grow reusable applied research and technology development in data plane network functions processing. We do this by focusing on reducing the barriers to performing research in this space to researchers and developers creating, implementing, and verifying their ideas on production networking hardware. OpenNFP supports research in a wide range of technologies, including software-defined networking, OpenFlow, OpenVSwitch, and P4. We support researchers with a variety of tools, including deeply discounted hardware, IDE software, and cloud access to development systems and direct support from our engineers and our research community. We also provide support to learning advanced networking concepts on our hardware through tutorials and seminars such as the one we are performing today. We encourage proposals to research funding agencies. We invite you to join the 40 plus universities and companies working directly with OpenNFP through projects. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Carly. And I should say that this is uh, work together with my students, Antoine and Tim, as well as collaborators at the University of Washington. So I'd like to start out with uh, some motivation. Um, the reason we are uh, trying to accelerate a networked applications is that, well, networks are becoming faster. And indeed, they're becoming faster at a staggering rate. This graph here shows you on the y-axis the bandwidth in bits per second for various Ethernet standards uh, over the year of that standards release on the x-axis. And I should point out that the y-axis here is logarithmic. So this straight line here really gives us a nice exponential growth curve for bandwidth of uh, commodity Ethernet. And in fact, uh, we could extrapolate this graph out a little bit further. If we talk to network researchers, they will comfortably predict that by the year uh, 2020, 2025, we're going to be introducing terabit Ethernet. And uh, so just to show you how fast these network networks can be, um, I'm taking a, a standard here that most of us are likely going to play with this year in practice, 100 gigabits per second Ethernet. This type of network is able to deliver a 64-byte packet to your servers once every five nanoseconds. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of what the headroom is that we have in, in our servers to do packet processing. Five nanoseconds is not a very long time. And the problem, of course, is that comparatively, software packet processing is quite slow. Uh, we went ahead and analyzed the overhead for TCP stack processing in various TCP stack implementations. So this is counting just a typical kind of server operation to receive a packet and then uh, to send the corresponding response out to that server request that is contained in that packet. We did this experiment on top of a 2.2 gigahertz Intel Xeon processor, fairly standard machine for data centers today. And our measurement result was that on uh, using the Linux operating system, we have a 3.5 microseconds overhead just for doing this TCP stack processing. Now, of course, we could go one step further and use state-of-the-art kernel bypass techniques and run the TCP stack at user level. But even there, um, we still have about one microsecond overhead for just doing purely packet processing. 
The underlying problem of this is, of course, that single core performance has stalled, which is mainly due to the end of Denard scaling uh, around 2007. And so some of you might now ask, uh, but we're getting more processes, of course. Can't we just parallelize this uh, processing for the, for the TCP or UDP stacks? Well, well, let's do a little back of the envelope uh, co uh, computation here. Uh, assuming that we have this one microsecond overhead for doing state-of-the-art TCP stack processing, over 100 gigabit per second Ethernet network that is able to deliver a packet to us every five nanoseconds and excluding any kinds of Amdahl's law effects such as uh, locks that uh, might impact the scalability of our stack, then we're talking about uh, 200 cores that would be busy constantly just doing TCP stack processing of 64 byte packets. Now you might say not every packet in the network is 64 bytes in length even though many of the client server applications that we're focusing on are skewed towards these smaller packet sizes. But even if we were to run a network purely with larger packets, one kilobyte size packets, we would still be talking about 14 cores in our servers being just constantly busy doing packet processing, not running any kinds of application code. And so that's not looking very good for energy efficiency. And this is a real world problem. Uh, in fact, many cloud applications are dominated by packet processing. Things like key value stores, real-time analytics frameworks, intrusion detection systems, file and web services, all have these kinds of properties. They all rely on small messages, and that means that latency and throughput is equally important to these applications. So even tricks that trade latency for better throughput, such as excessive batching, don't really work for these kinds of applications. So being faced with this kind of problem, we might be asking, what are the alternatives? What can we do instead? Well, uh, the first thing that perhaps comes to mind is RDMA, which is currently a hot topic in the systems research community. RDMA is short for Remote Direct Memory Access, and it essentially allows a server to make available a subset of its memory to various clients that can then exchange uh, uh, data directly with this piece of memory. And of course, the property of all of this is that it bypasses the server software entirely. All of this handled, is handled inside the network uh, card. And so this is inherently not very well matched to client-server processing. And uh, so many of the approaches that try to do client-server processing using RDMA are devolving back into a kind of more kernel bypass kind of approach by using two-sided RDMA uh, where the server core is involved for doing remote procedure calls. Uh, there are also various other drawbacks with RDMA, which is that the network has to play well with it in order for the network to, for, for it to be lossless, as well as a different uh, security model. The clients are now able to arbitrarily write into the server's memory regions, which is different uh, from what a traditional TCP IP network provides you. Another approach is to try and offload an application fully to the network card, typically using accelerators like an FPGA. This is primarily coming out of the architecture community, but also in the systems community. And this type of work has shown great improvements in terms of performance and energy efficiency, but it has the drawback that our application development is now at the slower hardware development speeds. We need to write code in Verilog, not in kind of a high-level programming language anymore. And that makes them very difficult to roll out in the first place, but also difficult to change once these applications have been deployed on these accelerators. And then we have our fixed function offloads, things like TCP segmentation offload, computing checksums on the networking card, and doing things like RSS, receive site scaling. And we think that this is a good start. However, uh, these kind of fixed function offloads are becoming too rigid for today's complex server and networking architecture. And I will explain on the next slide a little bit more what I mean by that. And so finally, our fourth alternative is to make these offloads more flexible. And that's going into proposals uh, and technologies such as Netronome's uh, flow processor as well as our FlexNIC proposal. proposal. What we're doing here is we're breaking down some of these fixed function offloads, for example, RSS, into their parts, and we're providing an API for the software developer. This could be the operating system developer or even the application developer uh, to have some flexibility into steering and directing these kinds of offloads so that we can do the packet, the, this, this uh, offloading more efficiently for our applications. 
So before I explain the FlexNIC approach, I'd like to just give you a little bit more insight as to why these fixed function offloads are just not very well integrated with the software processing that we'd like to do on top of our servers. And the first thing goes into a category that I would say are wasted CPU cycles. In order to realize many of these fixed function offloads, the network card already has to parse the packets, each packet that goes to the card, and validate them. And this parsing and validation is repeated in our software stacks in order for, for the stack to figure out what should be done with these kinds of packets that come in. Another drawback is that many uh, uh, network packet formats are for efficient parsing on the network by switches, by routers, but also by our network cards. Not so much for software access, which is why if you look at a common TCP uh, networking stack or a common application uh, packet processing, uh, uh, piece of code, that piece of code is littered with calls to functions such as convert from network to host byte order or tease various bit values out of different header fields to put it together to the value that we actually want. And all of this is work that is hard to do on the CPU while it's much easier to do uh, for a network card. And so the network card could pre-process some of these network uh, packet fields for more efficient processing on the service CPU. Uh, and finally, there's multiplexing tasks and filtering tasks that the network card is also already doing for us in order to realize offloads such as receive site scaling or single root I.O. virtualization, which we're again repeating in software. And so all of these things are things that I would classify under wasted CPU cycles on the server. We could do them more efficiently on the network card. Another problem that is created by fixed function offloads is that they're not always very well matched with what the application tries to do, which results in poor cache locality as well as extra synchronization for the CPU processing that the application ultimately wants to do with these packets. So for example, if the NIC does receive site scaling, it will steer packets to cores that will ultimately process them based on connection information, assuming that the locality of uh, the incoming packet stream is the same as the connection. But that might not always match the locality of the application. And again, I will have an example on that later in the talk. So a more flexible NIC can really help with many of these uh, drawbacks. For example, it could, with some help from the application, it could pick the right core to forward incoming packets to so that we don't have this cache synchronization overhead. And the network card is really perfectly situated to doing all of this work because it has to see all of the traffic that goes into and out of the server. So it is in the position to scale and pre-process packets according to software needs and to forward these packets among host CPUs and the network. Finally, there's also an opportunity that this kind of offloading, more flexible offloading approach gives us, which is if we are going the kernel bypass route, which is becoming more and more popular in, uh, in, in this time, um, then only the network card is in the position to enforce operating system policy efficiently. And for that, we need flexible network card mechanisms so that the operating system can instruct the network card what to do with uh, the packets that are generated by these kernel bypass applications, whether they're valid packets and whether the application is sending them according to, say, a congestion control protocol that might be uh, put upon the application due to TCP. Otherwise, we would have to always go back into the kernel, which would defy all of the kernel bypass that we have tried to do uh, in the first place. So now that I've motivated the FlexNIC model, um, in the rest of my talk, I'd like to give you an overview of this model and our proposal. Um, I will then tell you a little bit about our experience with Netronome's Agilio CX platform, which we've been using as a prototyping platform to see what the benefits of our FlexNIC model could be. And after I've done that, I will tell you a little bit about the neat things that we can then do with this model, both on the packet-oriented networking side, so accelerating applications that rely on protocols such as UDP, but also more flow control variants of UDP such as DCCP are possible. And then I will use my uh, remaining time to talk to you a little bit about some work in progress that we have uh, going on, which is to accelerate stream-oriented networking based on TCP. So the FlexNIC model for more integrated NIC and software processing for flexible offloading um, has as its underlying idea that it has to be very efficient. It has to be able, we have to be able to do it at very fast line rates, up to terabits per second. 
And we have to be able to do it at low cost, otherwise nobody would buy this kind of a network card based on this kind of model. And um, what we're doing here is we're taking inspiration from the mesh and action uh, pipelining approach that has recently been proposed for data center switches. In this kind of model, um, a switch incorporates a special type of hardware that um, at first has packets flowing into it on the left side here on the slide, but are parsed uh, and, uh, by, by a parser module that teases out the header fields that we are ultimately interested in. And these header fields are then uh, directed through a pipeline of match and action stages. These stages consist of TCAM memory, which is very efficient to match on various different um, these various different packet fields that are then connected to action ALUs that can make modifications to the packets in flight as well as uh, modify uh, packet metadata that can ultimately be used by the switch to decide what output port to forward a, a packet to. And what gives us the performance here is really that uh, the fact that this is a pipeline. As the first packet uh, finishes stage number one, the next packet can already enter the stage. And this is also very cheap to implement in switches. So essentially what we're trying to do is take this model and apply it to the design of a network card. Instead of making forwarding decisions in terms of output ports, we're making DMA decisions as to where in server memory we'd like to DMA packets to according to whether certain packet fields match. The way we program these pipelines uh, is uh, uh, fairly straightforward for this audience, I imagine. It's based on mesh and action programs, and uh, the P4 language is, is one of the implementations uh, of one of these uh, programming languages. I have an example here on this slide um, that is for a key value store that might be running on top of our server. Um, the match here is fairly simple. It just says if this is a UDP packet and if the port number is set to the port of the uh, key value store that is running inside our server, then execute the following action. And the action here is to compute a hash on the key field that sits within the application level key value store header inside this packet. And then take that result modulo the number of cores and use it to instruct the DMA engine of our network card to DMA this hash which we have already computed as well as uh, the application level key value store packet to the corresponding core according to this hash. And so this model, um, in more general terms, explicitly supports steering packets to various different cores inside our service system, doing things uh, that the network card is already able to do, such as calculating hashes and, and checksums, initiating uh, arbitrary DMA operations. We could use it to DMA straight into application-level data structures, trigger reply packets straight from the NIC without any kind of server involvement, and to modify packets in flight, such as stripping off headers that we have already validated that are not needed anymore for the application to further validate those incoming packets. What this model explicitly does not support is uh, complicated computations, such as loops and long running computations. These would defy the line rate processing capabilities. Also things like uh, floating point arithmetic is typically not possible inside, on, inside a network card. Uh, as well as keeping large state. Um, the state has to be able to fit into SRAM, which is also attached to this pipeline of match and action stages. So in order to integrate this with the network card, we take various of these pipelines, one for ingress, one for egress, one for, for DMA, and, and put them um, into the, the network card. I'm actually not going to go into much detail about that. Um, you can read the S plus paper, which we published last year, uh, if, if you're interested. But what this allows us to do is um, to do very efficient application level processing inside the network card. We can use it to improve locality by steering to cores based on application level criteria, to transform packets for more efficient processing in software, to DMA uh, parts of packets directly into and out of application level data structures, and to send acknowledgments straight from the network card. And as I said earlier, we've been using Metronome's Agilio CX platform to prototype this model in order to show that it can have benefits for server applications. The way we did that is we implemented our match and action programs in the P4 language and then compiled them and ran them on the network card. Our experience with the Agilio CX has been very good so far. We were able to do most of these tasks that I've just presented on the previous slide with the exception of DMAing directly into and out of application level data structures. Um, however, we're in touch with Netronome and uh, the engineers there are nice enough to 
look into developing this kind of uh, model as well. So after I've introduced the Flexnic model, I'd like to now tell you a little bit about what all the cool things are that we can do once we have such an accelerator. And we'll start out here with packet-oriented networking, in particular uh, a key value store. This slide here shows you a typical layout of, of such a key value store, including the clients, which you have here on the left-hand side. Uh, there are three clients attached here to one server. Um, the client boxes here also show us what keys these clients are accessing. And you can see here that there is some overlap. Um, some keys are accessed frequently not just by one client but by multiple clients, such as key 4 here by clients 1 and 2, as well as key 7 by clients 2 and 3. Everything to the right of the clients here is then what happens inside the server. You can see that those clients are attached, uh, connected to the network card of the server. And then we have two processor cores that run on the server that will ultimately process the client's requests, as well as a hash table that those cores are going to access in order to serve the key value requests. And so to walk through this example, what's going to happen is as these clients send us their packets with their requests, the network card is a fixed function offload networking card, would do receive side scaling, which means essentially to compute a hash on the connection tuple, things like IP address of those clients, as well as the port numbers of the connection, take it modulo the number of uh, cores, and then use that to index uh, and forward packets to the server cores for further processing. And in this example here, you can see that the hash function has decided that clients 3 and uh, client 1 should be handled by core number 1, and client 2 should be handled by core number 2. These cores are then going to access the hash table uh, to access the requested keys and, and values. And because there's overlap, you can see here that cores 1 and 2 will both access uh, keys 4 and 7. And what this results in is a model where we have lock contention, because there might be writes in this uh, key value store as well. And so we have to lock each access to our hash table, which will slow our server down. Um, but more so, we also have uh, poor cache utilization in this kind of model because the keys and their corresponding values for keys 4 and 7 are going to be duplicated in the L1 and L2 caches of cores 1 and 2, evicting other potentially hot keys from those caches, ultimately slowing us down again. And so with a more flexible network offloading approach, we could uh, install a more um, application-amenable steering approach, such as key-based steering. In this case, we would upload the program that I've shown you on the previous slide that um, hashes not on the connection information, but instead on the application level key field to the processor cores, which effect effectively has the effect that we're now uh, partitioning the hash table in two halves. One is handled by core number one, and the other one is handled by core number two. And in this model, as you can see, we do not need any further locks because we know that keys 3 and 4 are only going to be accessed by core 1 and keys 7 and 8 only by core number 2. And we also have an effectively higher cache utilization because there's never any duplication of keys and values in the cores L1 and L2 caches. Another thing we can do is uh, to use custom DMA to directly modify application level data structures. Uh, to do so, we introduce an event queue into the key value store, which we use to inform the, uh, uh, the software-sided processing on the key value store that events have happened, such as packets have come in. And we also use an item log that is directly operated upon by the network card that incoming set requests are deposited into. In this example, there's already one item in this log. So if, for example, a GET request comes in, the network card can use a program that will validate that this is a valid GET request and then strip off any of the headers that are not relevant for our application and only inject the fact that it is a GET request, the corresponding client ID from the packet, the hash which we've already computed, as well as the corresponding key into the event queue. This cuts down on the amount of uh, PCI bus overheads that we have for transferring these packets, as well as, of course, processing overheads on the software side. Similarly, if there is a set request, the network card can validate that it is a proper set request and strip apart the item that is within that packet that has the set request, put it into the item log, and then store just the fact that a set request has arrived, the corresponding client ID, and a pointer to that item into the event queue. 
This strips down on copying overheads that otherwise would have been incurred on the uh, server side in software. The application can now simply take this set event and deposit the item pointer into its hash table without any further copying of that item into the hash table space. So to show you that this has benefits in reality, we uh, implemented this on top of the Netronome NIC and measured the impact on top of, uh, uh, onto an, uh, an actual key value store which we implemented. For the, to realize the key base steering, we actually used the network card. Given that it wasn't able to do this custom DMA, we also have a software emulation of this match in action pipeline, which allows us to measure at least the throughput effects um, of custom DMA. The workload that we use is a fairly standard workload. We access 100,000 uh, small sized keys and values, so 32 byte keys and 64 byte values. That is uh, commensurate with many key value store deployments in the wild. Um, we also use 90% gets and 10% sets, and we run this whole thing on a six core Sandy Bridge Xeon at 2.2 gigahertz uh, with a card that has two uh, 10G links. This slide shows you the result on this graph. You can see throughput here in millions of operations per second on the y-axis over the number of CPU cores that were busy inside the server doing the processing. Uh, the two uh, important bars that we're trying to compare here are the red one and the green one, which are, is our key value store, which we term flex KBS. First in the red case, using just traditional fixed function offload with receive side scaling. And in the green case, using our more flexible key-based steering. Um, for reference, we've uh, also uh, put in results here for our key value store just running on top of uh, regular Linux, so this would not be using any kernel bypass, which is why it's a lot slower, and also uh, uh, against the memcached key value store, which is commonly deployed in, in data centers today. And what we can see here is that we achieve both uh, up to 45% higher throughput using uh, key, uh, the key-based steering, as well as uh, better scalability. We are, in fact, limited by the PCI bus as our bottleneck here, um, at starting at, at four cores. So we would expect that we would scale even further if we had a faster PCI bus. The overall processing time in terms of latency from request received to response sent out at the server side is now reduced from multiple microseconds down to 310 nanoseconds just by doing this kind of key-based steering. If we, in addition, use uh, the custom DMA um, to DMA set requests and get requests, stripping off any kind of access headers uh, into this, this event queue, we can strip down our packet processing time to 200 nanoseconds on the server CPU side. Uh, so much, much shorter than the processing time that we still had with our uh, even kernel bypass network processing stacks that were on the order of microseconds. Key value stores are not the only type of application that can benefit from this type of offloading. Another type of application that we analyzed is a real-time analytic system, such as Apache Storm. The goal of these systems is to provide you with real-time insights on a data set that frequently changes. And the way these types of applications operate is they run on a cluster of servers that updates to this data set stream through. It's also called a data stream processing oriented approach. And in order to make full use of all of the processor cores within each server, what the software does is run various different processing nodes on these processor cores. So in this example here that I have on this slide, there are uh, counting nodes as well as ranking nodes that take the incoming packets, they're also called tuples in the system, process on them such as counting types of a, uh, the, uh, uh, the number of a particular type of a tuple or ranking them in a top 10 fashion, uh, and then generating new tuples with these results. And in order to do so, software such as Apache Storm in incorporates various other threads that do demultiplexing tasks, as well as acknowledging that packets have arrived, as well as multiplexing tasks. So in Apache, it's fairly common to have two CPUs be completely busy, if you were to run this at 10 gigabit line rate only, uh, doing demultiplexing, acknowledging, and multiplexing of these tuples to and from these workers. And so if we extrapolate this out to the 100 gigabits, per second Ethernet network, which I've been using as a running example throughout this talk, we would be looking at 20 CPU cores in addition to the uh, operating system's network stack CPU cores doing this type of application level demultiplexing and multiplexing for our software. So with the FlexNIC approach, 
what we can do is offload this application level demultiplexing, acknowledgement genera uh, generating, and multiplexing to the network card as well, which results in there not being any need for CPUs to doing this in software. And hence, we have a much more energy efficient approach. All of our cores are now free to doing actual work for the application, such as counting and ranking in this example. We measured the benefits of this approach for real-time analytics as well um, by running it on top of a cluster of three machines. And uh, we determined the top N, I believe it was top 10, Twitter posters over a real Twitter trace. And we measured the attainable throughput of our system by basically trying to replay this trace as quickly as possible through our servers. The graph that I have here at the bottom of my slide shows you again throughput on the y-axis in millions of tuples per second uh, processed by the by our system. There are two configurations that we analyzed. One is a balanced configuration where the load is perfectly balanced over all of our servers so that relieves some of the load on individual servers. There are no performance hotspots. And then there's the group configuration where uh, there's a little bit of skew in the load and so there are performance hotspots generated and uh, in those cases because there's more pressure on each individual server the offloading has even better benefits than in the more balanced approach. Um, the two interesting bars we're comparing here, again, are the blue bar, which is our implementation, uh, which we term FlexStorm, using just regular kernel bypass with fixed function offloads in the blue case, and then the gray bar, which is using the offload of the demultiplexing and multiplexing and acknowledging tasks down into the network card. For reference, we again have a version that just runs on vanilla Linux uh, using the kernel's TC, uh, UDP stack, as well as uh, Apache Storm as well. And you can see here that in the balanced configuration, we attain a throughput improvement over kernel bypass of up to 2x um, and 2.5x if there are uh, load hotspots in our, in our cluster. Finally, another system that we uh, investigated is uh, network intrusion detection. Uh, in particular, we use the SNORT network intrusion detection system, which operates by essentially receiving a copy of every packet that goes through your network and then sniffing those packets using a pattern matching approach to detect attack patterns. The way SNORT is typically parallelized is by just simply running multiple instances of the SNORT application on a server. And in the status quo, we would be using receive side scaling of the incoming packets to those different uh, uh, processes of SNORT inside, running inside our server. In the FlexNIC approach, what we can instead do is we can analyze the rules that are loaded into SNORT, see how they're doing their processing, and then partition the rules in a smarter way among the different cores to maximize the use of the L1 and L2 caches in these cores. And then we install a program that uh, does more fine-grained steering to those cores according to our partition. And we've done that as well in, in our investigation, and we've see, seen that there is a 1.6x uh, throughput improvement over just vanilla SNORT. Uh, just to show you that this was really due to fewer cache misses, we also analyzed those, and we observed that there were about 30% fewer cache misses inside our system. So that concludes the uh, part about accelerating packet-oriented networking. Now I'd like to spend the rest of my time to give you a quick introduction over work that is still in progress, and that is to try and use the FlexNIC approach to accelerate applications that are based on stream-oriented packet protocols, such as uh, TCP. So our stance here is that full TCP processing is too complex to offload onto a network card that supports match and action processing only. Firstly, there is significant connection state that is required if one were to offload the entire TCP state machine to a network card and that would get us into connection scalability limitations similar to the ones that people are observing with, with RDMA-based approaches. Uh, there are also a number of tricky edge cases with TCP packet processing, such as packets might be arriving out of order or there might be drops, and uh, all of these corner cases of the state machine would, of course, have to be offloaded onto the NIC as well. And finally, um, there are various complicated algorithms for congestion control. This is actually an area where TCP is actively evolving, and if we were to fully offload TCP processing, we would either have to pick one of these approaches and offload that uh, in a fixed function manner to the, to the network card, st stifling all of the innovation that is going on right now. And of course, it would make the card even more complex because these algorithms typically rely on rather complex floating point computations. However, the common case is much simpler for TCP, in particular in the data center. And we claim that it, that case can be offloaded. 
This is the case where packets arrive in order. There are, there are no drops, and uh, we can also uh, co-design the congestion control algorithm together with the server-sided software processing. And so overall, this would reduce the critical path for a software to process these incoming packets. We also have this opportunity here, just to kind of circle back what I said in the beginning of the talk, to enforce the correct protocol, the correct TCP protocol, onto an untrusted application that might be using kernel bypass without having to go back through the kernel. And our focus here is in particular uh, in enforcing uh, a congestion control algorithm uh, that is imposed upon an application. So the main ideas of our flex TCP offload approach are to do the safety critical and common processing on the network cards. So this includes things like filtering incoming packets, validating acknowledgments, enforcing rate limits, and so forth. Uh, but to handle all non-common cases in software, things like packet drops, reordering of packets, timeouts on transmits, and so forth. We still require a small amount of per flow state in order to realize the flex TCP approach. Right now, we're at about 64 bytes per flow, mainly to uh, store things like sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers, as well as what queue an incoming packet should be forwarded to, and of course, the rate limit for outgoing packets for this application. So here's an overview um, of the flex TCP approach. Starting on the left here, we have TCP packets that are coming in and going out of our uh, flex of our flex NIC. The NIC is responsible for doing things like rate limiting, uh, doing segmentation of the TCP packets, sending out acknowledgments directly from the NIC without involving the server uh, further, and of course, it keeps this per flow state that I've introduced on the previous slide. In the common case, then, the NIC will validate the incoming TCP packets and store the payload that's on the packets directly into receive buffers that the application has provided for the network card. So the application can read directly out of these buffers. And in order to uh, alert the application of new arrival of, of more payload, uh, there's a per context uh, receive queue that the network card can uh, send the packet, uh, send the application uh, a notification that there's uh, of how much more data is available in these, in these payload buffers. And of course, we could use batching and things like that to optimize this uh, event processing as well. Uh, as soon as the NIC detects any kind of um, uh, packet that is out of the ordinary, any kind of exception packet that might uh, be a reordered packet, for example, or a mail form packet, the network card will stop the common case processing and instead forward that packet onto uh, a kernel queue that is directly attached to a co-designed network stack that sits inside the kernel that can then analyze this packet and resolve the situation. And after uh, the resolution, the kernel will inform the application via our kernel context queue uh, to resume common case processing. Before I conclude, just one more highlight on how we can do congestion control more flexibly with this approach. Um, in order to do this flexibly, we um, have the NIC enforce the perf, just per flow rate limits that can be set by the trusted kernel, uh, which gives us the flexibility to choose the congestion control protocol because we can implement the actual algorithm in software inside the kernel. And so just to give you an example here with uh, data center TCP or DC TCP, which is fairly common in data centers today, the common case processing is done on the network card, and this for DC TCP involves things like echoing packets that have been marked with explicit congestion notification via switch on the acknowledgement that is generated by the network card, and also to track the fraction of ECN marked packets per flow on the NIC. This information is then forwarded in batches to the kernel, which implements the actual control policy for DC TCP, and uses the NIC reported fraction of packets that are ECN marked to figure out what the rate limit should be for the various flows, which then programs back into the network card. So you can see that we have kind of decoupled the algorithm from the uh, low-level uh, grunt work that the uh, mechanisms that the card does in, in our case. And because this is now a more open feedback loop, um, we might be interested in figuring out whether this actually faithfully uh, follows the DCTCP protocol, which we did by simulating simulating this whole process at scale in, uh, in, in a simulated data center environment. And our current uh, our results so far are that it is indistinguishable from a pure software implementation of, of DCTCP. Finally, uh, a thing that we have also done in order to figure out what the overheads are of running the Flex TCP approach on top of a card such as the Netronome Agilius CX is we have implemented it in P4. 
uh, and then uh, run it in, in an experiment on top of the Agilio CX with just a null application attached to it. So this is really just a packet sync that does nothing. It's not in interested in the packets that come in. Um, but we load the, the server um, with packets as, as much as we can and uh, compare then to an implementation that uses the wire test application, which is Netronome's basic uh, NIC implementation that really does nothing uh, nothing smart on the on the on the network card side. It's just uh, emulating a, a standard fixed function network card. And uh, this graph here on on this slide shows you the attained throughput for these two configurations. And you can see here uh, that there's really not much slowdown from running uh, the flex TCP code on top of the metronome uh, card. Uh, uh, the highest slowdown that we observed uh, was for 512 byte size package, which is about five percent uh, for running the flex TCP code. So to summarize, um, networks are becoming faster while CPUs are not becoming faster, which is creating an increasing pressure on server applications to keep up with these developments. And our main claim here is that fast I.O. requires an efficient I.O. path to the application, which we do not currently have with fixed function offloads. So instead, we're proposing more flexible offloads that can eliminate some of these inefficiencies that we have seen in the fixed function offloading approach and give applications more control over where packets are processed as well as uh, allowing the NIC to do more efficient steering, validation, and transformation of packets as they flow into and out of our servers. Uh, I've shown you that this can have benefits by presenting various case studies, uh, among them a key value store, a real-time analytics framework, as well as a network intrusion detection system. And I was able to demonstrate up to 2.5x throughput and latency improvements versus regular fixed function offloading approaches that uh, use kernel bypass. The approach is, of course, also vastly more energy efficient because we're eliminating all of these server-side CPUs that would otherwise be required, even in a kernel bypass scenario, to do software-sided packet processing. And with that, I'd like to say thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Simon. This web webinar, as well as all previous webinars, can be found on the classroom page of the opennfp.org website. Thank you all for attending.